start by just introducing yourselves and uh, just I thought rather than me reading your bio, you know, maybe you can just tell the audience who you are. Sure, uh, Josh Lyon, VP of Marketing and Partnerships for Haiku. Haiku is a cannabis brand house located in lovely Toronto. Uh, we have four brands under our umbrella. We have physical retail. We have branded product on shelf, both cannabis and accessories. We have apparel and a whole lot more coming. And one of those retail brands is Tokyo Smoke, which uh, is actually one of your coffee shops is near my office. So uh, we know you guys to be a, a coffee shop, um, but obviously you guys do a lot of other stuff too. And Amanda. Hey everyone, I'm Amanda Marino, um, Chief of Staff at Herb. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with Herb, we are a cannabis platform. Um, our mission is to be the voice of cannabis culture. Um, we do this through the content that we create, and through that we've managed to curate the largest and most engaged cannabis community in the world. I'm just gonna get this question out of the way. Do you guys use cannabis? Do you use ca cannabis products, Josh? Yes. And did you, did you use any today? Yes. <laughs> I'm not high, but I did. Um, I take CBD oil three times a day. It's non-psychoactive. It helps with my somewhat insane stress levels. It helps with my old man bones. Um, I'm also a proud insomniac, so I have strains that help me sleep. So for me, it is a functional part of my life. Um, I'm actually a medicinal patient, so when I had a bunch of shoulder surgeries, I was handled a big bottle of opioids, and I kind of said, I have no interest in this. This is not what I want to be doing, and so I went an alternate route to cannabis. And Amanda, do you use cannabis? Oh yeah, I love, I love my cannabis. Um, yeah, so I use CBD, uh, similar to Josh, almost every day. Um, I smoke a one-to-one -one CBD THC flower um, pretty much every morning before I go about my day and every night before I go to bed. And I will tell you, I have some of the best sleeps I've ever had in my life since, since starting this. And it's been an incredible tool to help manage my severe anxiety, panic attacks. Um, yeah, it's immensely increased the quality of my life. So it's been great. I know that this is what you guys do, but I feel kind of awkward right now that I'm sitting <laughs> at CBC Glenn Gould Studio with cameras pointed at us in front of a crowd of people talking about cannabis. It's and legal. It, but it's legal. Like, this is, this is totally legal. And uh, I, I keep finding myself tempted to want to use the word marijuana or herb. Uh, and you mentioned something to me in the green room earlier today. You said that actually those are not politically correct terms. So I guess, you know, in terms of marketing cannabis basics 101 and not just marketing but I guess you know social media uh, media reporting all that like help me understand the lingo what, what, what is politically correct and not correct here um, yeah so I can touch on this a bit so marijuana was actually a term um, that was used by the Americans around the time of reefer madness and um, in the 1930s when American politicians were pushing prohibition and and creating insane cannabis laws. Um, and it was tied to, to racism. So, you know, using marijuana, it's not, it's not that you're perpetuating racism or supporting racism, but it's kind of you're celebrating a time of prohibition. And in this day and age, I, I think us industry people um, prefer the term cannabis. So can you tell us a little bit, um, Amanda, about your audience to give a sense of how big your community is and maybe you know, a little bit about the demographics of that group? Totally, yeah. So as I was mentioning before, um, through the content that we've been curating for cannabis enthusiasts, um, you know, we keep four things in mind, tasteful, authentic, social first, and cannabis first. And through that, we've been able to, to gather this large and engaged community of cannabis enthusiasts. Um, and this community is essentially 60% male, 40% female. It's a global audience, but 70% of these people are in the United States. Um, and it's actually kind of funny because even though surface level it's 60, 40, male to female, actually 60% of the females are the ones who are actually engaging in our content. That's really interesting. And, and uh, how did Herb get started? 
was it always the plan to become a full-fledged media company or is this sort of a passion project that evolved into something bigger? Um, yeah, I mean, this is more of Matt's, Matt's story to tell. And for those of you, I apologize, I'm not Matt Gray, if you were expecting Matt Gray. Obviously, I'm not him. Um, I appreciate you all accepting me as your panelist today. Um, and I'm gonna try fill, and fill his shoes as much as I can. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, Matt just wanted to start he saw a massive opportunity in cannabis. You know, he had personal instances where he saw cannabis directly help people that he was super close with get through depression. Um, and so he saw an opportunity to connect cannabis enthusiasts to a platform and, ha and give them a voice, give them an opportunity to share and connect with, with content that would be both educational and informational, as well as entertaining. Um, and, and it didn't exist back then. So it was about five years ago when Matt kind of started this off. So for, for businesses and brands in the cannabis space, and, and not to mention users, we keep hearing that stigma is a huge hurdle to overcome. So I think, you know, probably as an extension of that story, a big part of what you guys are trying to do is, is sort of re... Uh, just challenge that that stereotypical um, image, and I think you know one one thing that uh, we've got a video. Uh, if you guys can roll that in a second, uh, why don't we roll the video? I think it sort of speaks for itself, and I'll continue after. Let's do it. We're just going to play a, a short <laughs> clip of this it. This is collaborative collaboration. Can you do it? Cooperation. Wait, now I don't work. Okay. Okay, go. I'm gonna break this for sure. No, just. I will. Come on, girl. I've been here forever. So now what? Uh, well, we. I'm still cleaning. I'm still cleaning. Oh, oh. Cut a small hole or X on the side of your pumpkin for your next downstream. No, it needs to be a bit bigger then. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Yeah. Stop now. Stop now. Stop now. Stop now. Okay. Stop now. Cut a small hole. In the other side, a bit higher for your mouthpiece. Don't make it too big. Okay. On the other side, meaning the Here, opposite side. side. Yes. Yeah? <laughs> so it goes on like that for a couple more minutes, and I thought, well, we're not, we're not, uh, the purpose of today isn't to teach you how to make a, 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 a sorry, what is it called? It's a bong. Pumpkin, Pumpkin bong. Pumpkin bong. If you want to know, bong. hit me up after, I'll, I'll yeah. teach you. <laughs> Um, but, but the reason I wanted to show that video today was to just highlight, uh, you know, just the, the range of content. There's stuff that's really serious on your site, there's stuff that's educational, there's political stuff, there's a lot of fun stuff, but certainly this is not the image that comes to mind when you think of a cannabis user. You may think of that sort of stere stereotypical, lazy, couch potato pothead. Um, that we've been shown in film and television through the years. So um, can you just speak to a little bit about how videos like this and other uh, content you're creating is helping to reframe what, what a cannabis user is in Canada totally. and around the world? Yeah, I can just touch on stigma for, for just one second. I mean, I think the source of stigma is coming from a lack of information and a lot of misinformation being given to, to everyone. I mean, I know that when I grew up, cannabis was a gateway drug, if I smoke weed, I'm gonna end up on the streets and be homeless, and I mean, that scared me, and I think that scares a lot of people, and I think if, if people aren't willing to push the boundaries and explore cannabis as a medicine, and as a recreational drug as well, they're never gonna know, and they're just gonna always have the stigma in the back of their head. So, at Herb, I mean, we see cannabis enthusiasts every day, and these cannabis enthusiasts, they're mothers, they're fathers, they're professionals, they're accountants, they're lawyers, they're fathers, sons, brothers, sisters. I mean, anyone can be a cannabis enthusiast and that's I think what we're, we're trying to highlight here is just, yeah, there's definitely educational, informational content that people need to get the correct information to be able to break the stigma, but everyone loves to laugh. And I mean, that's a huge, a huge thing that surrounds cannabis is like, who doesn't want to watch three moms making a pumpkin bong? <laughs> Absolutely. And Josh, you know, on the topic of, of stigma, I'm sure that you have some, some things to say on that as well. When I look at Tokyo Smoke, for instance, you know, very much a lifestyle brand, very much about prom promoting the uh, elevated cannabis experience. Um, so is, is this stigma around cannabis something that you're trying to, uh, like that you're actively trying to overcome as well in your marketing efforts? 
Yeah, I mean, I think it's something you have to address. If you consider roughly 25% of Canadians consume cannabis, another 15 to 20% are interested in doing so now that it's legal. So if you have 40% of people consuming, to have one viewpoint of who that person is seemed like a weird notion to us. Mm -hmm. And for us, it was less about identifying who is a cannabis consumer and more about facilitating conversation with them, providing a safe place to ask questions, to learn, to try. You know, people always ask, like, why did you start with a coffee shop? That's the most approachable place in the world. People go there as part of their daily routine. It's a place they hang out. It's a place they work. It's a place they spend $3 and then sit there for six hours and don't buy anything else. But it's some place that is just part of the daily routine. And so for us, we wanted to create a home in cannabis for those that didn't feel like they had one. And it's about a natural integration in your day-to-day -day life. And if we can naturally integrate cannabis into your routine, even being surrounded by cannabis and cannabis culture, that's a way that we can facilitate conversation. That's a way we can open up dialogue. That's a way we can get you to interact with the cannabis brand, where when we started, we were three plus years away from being able to sell you any product in terms of cannabis itself. So how do you create a long-lasting relationship with someone when I actually can't give you what I want to give you? So for us, it was, yes, overcoming stigma through education and through also just, again, showcasing to people that, like, you know, look to your left, look to your right. One of those people consumes cannabis. Like, we're all normal, functioning adults who have made a choice to have cannabis as part of our life. I'm curious, actually, was, was, uh, was that strategic? Did you guys see legalization coming down the pipeline and say, okay, let's find a legal way to get a retail footprint out in the environment and build a brand and build awareness and, uh, you know, build relationships with the public and then boom, this drops. Or was that just luck? It was a bit of luck. I mean, when we started Tokyo Smoke, it was pre-Trudeau, pre the idea of fall 2018, pre the idea of sitting here in this amazing time. Um, but what we did realize is that there was this federally essentially mandated uh, medicinal system, and that, again, cannabis played such a large role in people's lives. We felt that whether or not it was going to be legalized, there was a space for brands to operate. There was a space for companies to help create that conversation, create that dialogue, and make it okay to talk about cannabis, to delve into cannabis culture, to buy cannabis paraphernalia and not feel like you're a 13-year-old hiding something from your parents. Like, that's not the feeling we want when we talk about cannabis. It's something we should feel good about. It was odd to us that you could go to someone's house and say, I want to have a drink, and they would say, here's my glassware, here's a nice bottle of scotch, here's, you know, my scotch rocks. And then it's like, okay, well, you know, let's dab a little weed. And it's like, okay, I'm going to go get the shoebox from under my bed. It's like, it just didn't have to be like that. So we felt we could help start that movement. That's really interesting. Um, so, in, you know, like, like any brand, you've got a story to tell. You, you want to start these conversations. You want to engage your audience. Um, and coffee shops are a great place to do it. But as we know, online is, is really where the, the real opportunity for conversations um, on an exponential level to, to take place. How do you do that in a space that's so, so heavily regulated? How do you tell your story? How do you reach people? Yeah, it's a good question and the reason I have gray hair. Um, and, and I just want to interject it for a second and say that, you know, Josh is not a lawyer. He's not here to give you guys legal advice. He's just going to share his perspectives from having to navigate this space in real time as we all are sort of trying to navigate it. Yeah, I think so. We were living in kind of two worlds. It was pre-October 17th where Bill C-45, the Cannabis Act, wasn't in place yet and you could do and say a little bit more than you can now. The Cannabis Act, I won't get into the totality of it, but it's akin to tobacco. And the question I always ask is, when is the last time you saw a tobacco company do something interesting, engaging, different? You just, you don't. Um, it's unfortunately not like alcohol in the cannabis space, but what's interesting and exciting for us is, you know, I've worked with a lot of brands and a lot of companies who are trying to push product to people. This is the first industry I've been a part of where people are so hungry for information mm. and are choosing to interact with brands and are looking for information, whether it's on Herb or, I was about to name your competitors, I'm not going to, whether it's on Herb or Much our love. sites or other sites or in-persons or going to educational events, 
like little things like we held a job fair in Manitoba, and I've never seen millennials more excited to be looking for work. Um, but I, th I think really for us, it's establishing a place where people can choose to interact. And we know people are out there, they're searching, they're looking. Um, your site traffic is a good proxy to how much hunger there is for product knowledge and information. People, you know, all this information is coming online. There's this big, exciting world. How can you be the resource to provide that? And how can you do that in a way that speaks to a consumer's sensibilities? That's the biggest thing, is that translating the language of cannabis to something that people already understand and know. How do you talk to someone through a lens they already understand? And that's why we use design and coffee it was so that we were on the same footing, recognizing that even as interested as people are in cannabis, maybe it's 5% of their lives, maybe, but they have other outside interests, they have hobbies, they have ways that you can connect and showcase how cannabis can be integrated into their lives. So I'm not gonna get into all the legalities of what we can't do, everything has to be age-gated, you can only speak to product characteristics or brand preference. Brand preference is putting something on something that is not associated with a lifestyle, that is not, you know, doesn't condone positive or negative emotions. So you can't do all the interesting, exciting, engaging things that potentially we could beforehand, but you can be that conduit to provide information. One thing that we keep hearing from brands in the cannabis space and agencies is that like some of these companies are multi-billion dollar companies that would normally be pouring in huge amounts of money uh, into Facebook, ads, Google, AdWords, YouTube, uh, all, all the platforms. So, but my understanding is that's not, you can't do that. You cannot do any advertising on social media, zero. Yeah, so I'm, we deal with kind of the federal government regulations and legislations, and then each individual platform has their own stance on cannabis. And so cannabis is still federally illegal in the US, so a lot of the large-scale digital properties are unwilling to take money from a cannabis company because you are now aiding and abetting drug dealers or whatever so we So what are. would happen if you just, if you went into, like I, I guess short of your ad being rejected, what if an ad got through? Would, you, would they shut down your page or? It, so, you know, I did an ad two and a half years ago for a chance to win incense. Incense, nothing to do with cannabis, but and you this know, was from Tokyo Smoke. This is from Tokyo Smoke. It crawls the ad, it crawls the URL. Our URL, our website, obviously spoke to cannabis, so that ad got shut down. Our ad account got shut down. Okay. Um, that was for incense two and a half years ago. So we, the traditional toolkit that a lot of brands have, we do not have. So I think you know what's really interesting here that that we're seeing, um, you know, from companies that have resources, from agencies that are highly creative. Um, is that, you know, in, the, in light of not being able to advertise um, in, in a world of, you know, where Facebook is, is really thought of as a pay-to-play channel, all of a sudden we're back at having to be creative and having to look at organic strategies, having to look at native advertising, having to work with influencers. Um, Amanda, for, as a platform, what are some of the options available to cannabis brands looking to get their products and services out there online um, who aren't allowed to, to advertise in the traditional way. Um, yeah, just to kind of go off what Josh was saying, like, uh, cannabis is still a Schedule One drug in the United States alongside heroin and cocaine. Um, so, and that's on a federal level. So, I mean, the options are super, super limited to anyone who's in the cannabis industry to be able to advertise. No Facebook, no Instagram, no Google. Um, so that's where kind of brands are interested in collaborating on content with um, companies such as myself, Herb, um, and kind of high-level brands are looking to get access to our large and engaged community. Um, you know, we have 5 million UVs per month on our website. We have 10 million people on Facebook, almost a million people on Instagram. So, and these are all cannabis enthusiasts. So, you know, brands like um, Pax or Stores and Bickle or Bebo um, will reach out to us and and want to collaborate on some of our content and we can kind of help them out by integrating their products in some of our video content like like you just saw hi mom's making bongs so yeah can you just maybe elaborate on some of these brand collaborations uh native advertising content marketing strategies where can be some examples of some brands that you've worked with um yeah like i mean 
someone like a, a Levo oil or a magical butter infuser, we make recipe videos. Um, and that's kind of going along the educational and informational side of things, which resonates really, really strongly with our community. Um, and we'll kind of use their oil in, in the recipes that we make. So that's just one example. Obviously, you are a major influencer in the space. You've got the reach and the audience. Do you also work with individual influencers, uh, personalities in, in the cannabis space? Um, I think we really are the influencer in the space. Mm -hmm. um, and the way we kind of, our take on influencers is not so much influencer marketing per se, but more our community, they, each and every single one of them are influencers in their own right. Um, and for, for one of them to be able to share our content and get the message out there to their friends, that in itself is influencer marketing. And can you guys do any paid uh, for, from your publication? I'm assuming no. All organic. All organic. Yeah. Oh, so, so we know, like everybody wants to say, like they're 100% they're organic. Like, no, we didn't spend any money. We just, we're great at what we do. But you truly, like we know that that's true. Yeah. I mean, that you did not spend a penny to get yeah. where you are. So that's really impressive. Um, I am hearing though increasingly that, you know, identifying these influencers, um, that, you know, it is the, the answer. It has all of the benefits that influencer marketing traditionally has, but it's also the answer to this problem of, you know, we've got a budget, we want to get in front of people, we can't advertise. Uh, it addresses the stigmatization in a way because, you know, you put different faces, different personalities, different profiles behind it. Pe spokespeople who are willing to come out of the cannabis closet. We, we hear that term sometimes. Um, is that something that you guys have explored, uh, Josh? Previously, yes. Uh, Pre-October 17th. Post-October 17th, that world is pretty shut down for us, too. Legally. Yeah, so we can't advertise on any, any non-age-gated environment. So if we were to pay an influencer to do something on their channel, that's a non-age-gated environment unless they were to start something completely new for us. Um, you are not allowed to give direct or indirect compensation for things, too. So if I was to even send an influencer, uh, number one, I'm not allowed to send them anything, cannabis accessory or cannabis itself. If I was to send them, you know, swag and they post, that could be construed as indirect compensation for posting on our behalf in a non-age-gated environment. So it's really fun. So your social media, <laughs> yeah, it's as a marketer, as a, somebody that runs a marketing agency like that, I feel stressed out hearing about that. So, so what? So is the strategy truly really then build it and they will come? Like you are really just creating content, updates, sharing stories, putting it out there, and if yeah. they're interested, they will come. I mean, the reality is there's a lot of age-gated environments, and content partners are building out their own age-gated environments. The Daily Hive um, has a good one, you know, out west. I know Vice is looking to do their own. So. You know, obviously, the herbs of the world exist that are already age-gated, so there are places you can be, there are content partners you can work with. Um, you know, events is very big for us, so the in-person, grassroots, provide people a value-add experience. Um, I'm always shocked at the number of people that come out to our higher learning events, which is kind of Cannabis 101, because again, there is this thirst for information and knowledge. So online or offline, if you're answering the user's needs, and there's a lot in terms of what do I need to know when I'm walking into a dispensary? What does this all mean? What experiences can I have? And how do I get those experiences? Answer those questions. You're going to build a community. Mm. Well, and then we also know the other thing that works is content, like really, really good content. And I know, Amanda, on Herb, uh, the content is increasingly... Uh, I, I actually uh, read a news article. I don't know if it was... Uh, I think it was maybe a year ago. Uh, that Herb had secured a large amount of, of funding um, really to focus on, on video. And Matt had said that, um, you know, he really felt that the, the Facebook al algorithm was really favoring video because it is more engaging. People are obviously engaging with the content for a longer amount of time. Um, so is, is that a big part of why you guys are like, you know, now I guess a year later, like how, how is that going? Are you still really focusing and pushing video? Has that changed at all? Yeah, I mean, since we've started, content's really just been our bread and butter. Um, you know, we, I think like four or five years ago, we were, we were making recipe videos and putting them on YouTube. They have hundreds of thousands of views. 
Um, and now, over the past few years, we've really leaned into video, and I think it's more of like a, an adapt and evolve strategy that we've kind of taken on. Um, engagement is kind of everything for us, and we really focus on meaningful engagement, so likes, comments, shares on social, and we've seen massive growth through video content. So, you know, uh, an episode we just posted on um, Instagram a couple weeks ago, how do you know if your weed is good quality? Um, that video has almost 800,000 views and almost 90,000 engagement, so. Is, is that practical type of information something that you're finding? Like I know, I, you, maybe you could do a better job of breaking down your themes, but I would break it down as sort of like there's the, the fun content, like there's fun humorous stuff, and you've got a lot of recipes. Yep. There's a lot of how-to yep. and information. What are some of the, the content categories that do really well for your audience? Is there yeah. a method to the madness? No, you, you hit, it, hit it on the head there. Um, yeah, so how-to is, it's extremely, engaging for our community, you know, DIY, how to make a bong, how to roll a joint, something as simple as that, to how to make your own hash, um, how to make a rose petal blunt, you know, those things do phenomenally well as well. So there's kind of different, different parts of our community that enjoy different types of these how-to videos, depending on their expert level. Mm. Um, and then, yeah, funny content as well, you know, humor, is a huge part of cannabis, like I was saying earlier, and everyone's always looking to laugh, especially after they smoke a bit of weed. <laughs> and uh, what about you, Josh? Are there certain themes that resonate with your audience? Yeah, I think, well, we have four brands under our umbrella, and the type of content we create will obviously differ brand to brand. So a brand like Vanderpop, female-focused brands, started by this amazing woman, April Pride, out of Washington State. We actually conducted a survey of 1,500 women across North America looking at consumption patterns, behaviors, attitudes, perceptions, why they consume, why they were scared to consume, areas of interest, and then we focused our content creation, our articles and events on the pillars we saw come out of that. So I think it's, again, it's us not creating in a vacuum, it's understanding what the community wants to see and varying our content based off of who we're speaking to. So, you know, Doja, which is our West Coast grower out in beautiful Kelowna, their content is more focused on the quality of the product, the growing techniques, probably for a bit more of an advanced cannabis consumer. Whereas a lot of the Tokyo Smoke stuff, we've seen our audience is kind of curious, potentially know the most in their group. Um, I'm taller than my niece and nephew. They're seven and four. That doesn't make me tall. We kind of see that with, uh, cannabis consumers as well. They might know the most in their group, but there's a lot of information that's coming out that they potentially don't know, so it's more education focused. So, you know, I think also with Tokyo Smoke, it was heavy, heavy into design, curation, product design, product quality, and really, again, that was speaking to kind of the urban creative consumer and how do you bridge that gap and start that conversation? It was design first. Yeah. Very cool. People are comparing the cannabis craze in Canada to the dot-com bubble, which I think is very interesting. Um, actually, quick survey of the audience. I'm curious, who, who thinks that this is a bubble and who thinks it's the real deal? So let's go with bubble first. Okay, and who thinks it's, it's just gonna keep growing real deal? Yeah, okay. <laughs> and, <laughs> and and where what, what, I'm not going to ask what you think because I think it's clear where, where you guys would stay but what would you say to those critics or to those skeptics yeah I think when you looked at the dot com bubble you had a lot that came out of it that was good and positive and really helped consumers lives and you had a lot of crap uh, money was readily available it seemed like every idea was getting funded when you look at the cannabis space it's a pre-existing user base it's people who have been consuming for decades and decades. It's people who have learned how to integrate it into their lives. It's been used for medicinal and recreational purposes. I think this is the first time we're seeing an, emer uh, an emerging industry that has a user base already established and interested. Um, that was not the case in the dot-com bubble. You were trying to come up with new tech and new innovation to help people's lives. Some of them were really useful and a lot of them died off and I think there's been a lot of capital poured into the cannabis industry. Potentially, not all of it is smart capital, just like any other industry, but 
Again, when you have millions of consumers in Canada, tens of millions in North America, hundreds of millions across the world, and when you look at the innovation that's happening in the industry in terms of drinkables, edibles, topicals, ways of naturally integrating into people's lives, ways where you're not asking people to consume in a manner that they wouldn't normally consume any other substance. Um, and the last thing I'll say kind of on it is there's still a lot of research to be done in the space. And, you know, there's over 113 different cannabinoids in the plant. We have a good amount of information, really, on two of them. So as more funding goes into research, there's a lot more that's going to be discovered, and I'm very optimistic about the potential benefits we're going to find. Perfectly said. Perfectly well, said. Well, then I'll ask you, Amanda, how do you think cannabis legalization is impacting the world's perception of Canada? Um, I think we're trailblazers, and, I mean, I think the world's kind of looking at us as an example to see what happens, to take learnings from us if we mess it up or to take learnings from us if they see massive success. So I'm super proud to be a Canadian in this day and age and super proud that we've been able to take this massive leap forward and to be able to legalize a plant that has helped so many people across the world and, and now they have access to this, to this medicine. It's awesome. And how do you think Canada is influencing the world's perception of cannabis? You can touch. You can yeah, touch. I mean, you know, having been in this industry three, four years, which in the real world is not a long time, in cannabis it is a long time, um, we've had the pleasure of talking with a host of countries from around the world who have come to Canada to learn what we're doing, to see the model, to see what's working, to see what's not working. And so I think Canada, you know, we, disclaimer, uh, our company was purchased by Canopy. Canopy had a $5 billion investment from Constellation Brands. Constellation owns a whole bunch of liquor brands. Um, they're using Canada as the testing ground for how this model is going to expand across the world. And so when I think of how we're shaping international uh, cannabis perception of the industry, I think what we can do here is gonna be the model for the rest of the world. How we evolve, how we adapt, the regulations we put in place, like this is, this is where it's starting and that's something I know I'm proud of, I think Canadians should be proud of. I have this naive, hopefully somewhat true belief that society will be a better place with legalized cannabis, with people having the ability to take control of their health and wellness. And I think hopefully that reflects positively on the rest of the world. Well, I know as a marketer, this is just a really, really exciting thing to watch, even from the sidelines. Um, and, and there are a lot of marketers that are diving in head first into this. Um, I thank you guys so much for being here. We're not going to end just yet. We have about five to ten minutes for, I'll, I'll say, okay, seven minutes for questions. Um, and we've got mics roaming around the room. Any questions, guys, for Josh and Amanda? Any brave hands? There we go. Just uh, wait for the, yeah, that way everyone can hear you. Hi. Um, so I'm wondering, so I'm, I'm guessing on social media there's a lot of negative sentiment that, that you find from people that don't agree with cannabis and, and whatnot. I'm wondering uh, how your social media team deals with negative sentiment. Do you guys typically ignore or have you tried to use messaging to change people's minds and what the reaction has been like? I mean, for us, online we actually don't see negative sentiment from non-cannabis users. I think they're just not choosing to follow cannabis brands. It's probably not in their, um, you know, in their purview. We see that more um, in person at events. It's always interesting when you see someone walking towards your booth and you're trying to guess, okay, is this gonna go well? Or are they gonna yell at me for ruining their children's lives? Um, and that's something, you have the conversation, you know, you can have the conversation, chances are, if you are staunchly anti-cannabis, you're not going to change your mind for me talking to you. It's going to take time, right? It's going to take real information coming out, it's going to take more research, it's going to take years. When you look even at, you know, prohibition, as soon as alcohol was legalized, it wasn't like, okay, great, we're good to go. Um, I think, you know, when we did our study for Vanderpop, 70% of women felt that, that, that there was a negative perception of cannabis consumption, and that was relatively equivalent across states that had legalized, states that were medicinally legalized, Canada, and states that didn't have a legal program, right? So I don't think we're gonna snap our fingers. 
Um, you know, we've seen some negative um, feedback from kind of uh, people who have been in the cannabis space for a long time, and that's, again, you try to facilitate conversation. Online, people don't always want to have that conversation. It's a lot of yelling back and forth behind a keyboard, and so sometimes you just get to the point where if, if, if you don't actually want to talk, we, we won't engage. So in both your experiences, what has been the most surprising insight that you've come across so far? So maybe question. from a digital, digital or social perspective. Surprising insight. I mean, for me, I think getting in, I didn't truly have an appreciation for the diversity of people who consume cannabis. Um, you know, the story I always tell, and this is an offline story, but I was in our shop working, and a couple came in who were in their early 70s, and they bought a you know, $400 vaporizer, and they said, this is the only place where we feel comfortable having this conversation and buying this type of product. And like, I'll be straight up, what do 70-year-olds do has never been in my marketing plan. Um, but I think it's, cannabis is it's for anyone and everyone who chooses to consume. So I think when we think of the information that we're going to put out there, what our social, what our digital strategy is, you often have to think bigger than you may have when you try to like hyper target your audience. So I think that was really interesting for me. Yeah, and I think just on my side, I touched on this a bit, but I think just the engagement um, and the potential for engagement on cannabis content is absolutely incredible. People just want to have their voice heard and there's so many people out there who have a story of how cannabis has helped them. And so that's kind of what Herb's trying to do is give these people a voice and a platform to share their story and just seeing and reading some of these stories, it's just been absolutely mind-blowing, and sometimes I'm even brought to tears, and it's just like, wow, this is an incredible thing, and this is an amazing movement that, that we're all getting behind here in the cannabis industry, and, and the amount of engagement that comes from women, too, on the content, that's, it's been amazing to see, because I know, like Josh was saying, um, women feel very, um, there's this perception that you know women shouldn't smoke weed. Um, when you think, when you say you smoke weed, they're like, ooh, like I don't know, it's just a bad vibe. Um, and so seeing that women are engaging in our content has just been absolutely amazing. Question over here. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Jeffrey Stewart. I run a cannabis technology company, and we're making a smart home vaporizer that connects with the uh, Google Home and smart assistants. Um, my question is, um, do you have any advice for brands and products that don't touch the plant about how to approach our social media strategy? Is it more flexible than companies that touch the plant? If you're a service provider, you are beholden to the same regulations. Um, so I think when you're looking at you know, potentially wanting to partner with licensed producers or others to get your technology out there, I, would, I always advise to be cautious in terms of what you do from a marketing standpoint. Um, the reality is, is this is an interesting industry where Health Canada monitors not only your marketing, but also your ability to get permits to grow, to sell, retail, all of that. So what you do from a marketing perspective can impact what you can do in business as a totality. So you as a service provider, you're under the same fun regulations we are. Hi. Um, so a few months ago, I heard there was rumors that Coca-Cola was looking to do like a CBD infused drink. And I was wondering, do you think that if the larger brands, you know, there's a lot of money behind them, were to start to create products that they would lobby to sort of change the, you know, the regulations and the rules behind it? Because from their standpoint, if they're not able to really advertise it the way that they do their non-CBD drinks, um, and I guess it's all rumor and all hearsay at this point, but I know some stocks like jumped when they were talking about it. So do you think that big brands coming in with a lot of money would have an effect on that? Because right now I feel like it's a lot of smaller brands or Canopy Growth has a lot of money, I know, but just wondering your opinions on that. Yeah, I think from my perspective, we're in day, what, 25 of legalization. It's 
much easier to have a tight rope and loosen it later than to have a loose rope and tighten it later. You know, when you talk to regulators who I won't name, and you kind of make the point like, well, you know, this, there's medicinal cannabis. Why are we being treated like tobacco when alcohol can kind of go and do? And they, rather than saying like, yes, it should be loosened like that, they more so say, we screwed up with alcohol. So I think the hope, not the hope, the reality is the government is going to be more conservative to start. And we're going to see how this works. There's going to be more testing. We're going to look at youth consumption, if it's gone up or down, if the system's working, if it's reducing the illicit market. And I am naively, again, confident that as we see that this is a safe, regulated, educated movement, the restrictions that we're under will start to loosen. The reality is cannabis is hyper-confusing. It's incredibly personal for your experience. If you have a strain and I have a strain, chances are we'll have a slightly different experience. The way we're going to get past that is education, is to be able to properly speak to product, to efficacy, to quality. And I think that will come out hopefully within the next few years where regulations will have to be loosened in order to ensure that we are having that safe movement. Again, my, my last, while I'm on my somewhat pedestal, is that if you want to get rid of an illicit market, if you want consumers to change behavior, you have to give them a choice that is as good or preferable to what they were doing before. And I think people were very comfortable in the illicit market in terms of the products they were getting, the ability to ask questions, the ability to go to a dispensary to have beautifully branded stuff. And if we want to remove that, we have to provide something of equal value. And hopefully that will result in looser restrictions. We can take one more question. Okay, over here, the red. Thank you guys for the talk. Um, I wanted to ask what are your thoughts on um, the fact that what we know now about the, the, the war on drugs in the first place was heavily racially motivated. If the, if, do you feel like, um, like players and figures in your industry have a responsibility to advocate for those uh, who were criminalized for something that's now like legal today? Totally. Yeah, 100%. I um, were personally at Herb working on a, a couple um, projects that speak directly to, to what you're talking about. We haven't necessarily chosen the, the correct avenue and how we're going to support people who have been wrongfully incarcerated, um, you know, nonviolent drug offenders who might have been arrested for having, you know, three grams of cannabis on them or something. But uh, we're definitely looking into this, and it's something that's extremely close to our heart. So... Yeah, I know we've partnered with Cannabis Amnesty. Um, so about 500,000 Canadians um, have been arrested for nonviolent minor cannabis possession that impacts your ability to rent a home, to get a job, to volunteer. If it comes up in divorce proceedings, you can lose your children. Um, I think, you know, we all understand we're standing on the shoulder of giants. People sacrificed a lot to get this industry to where it is. And I think it would be naive of us not to look to the past and, you know, hopefully help everyone who has gotten us to where we are. Um, so, you know, go to pardon.life to sign the petition for cannabis amnesty. We're trying to get 10,000 signatures. The federal government recently made an announcement that they were looking into pardons for those um, who have a nonviolent conviction. So what we're trying to do is help push that forward. Josh and Amanda, thank you so much for joining us today to shed light on this topic. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you. And